All right, so we're going to go quickly here to Canon 95 of the Council of Tru in Trullo, and we're going to say a few words about it because it's important, but we're going to come back to that probably next week. So if you don't get it now, don't be too bent out of shape. There's a lot to cover in a quick, short amount of time. Now, this canon is very important. We're going to read it right here in a second, but I want to introduce it to you. This is a this is the so-called Council in Trullo, or the Penthecti or Quinisect Council, and that is essentially the council that happened uh, to to put down a few years after the Sixth Ecumenical Council to put down the canons for both the Fifth and Sixth Ecumenical Councils. Essentially, they be, they became known as the canons of the Fifth and Sixth Ecumenical Councils, and they're accepted by the whole church. And they they collected and essentially did the work of a, a, a book of canons for the church. They collected ancient canons, recognized them, and and so this ninety five canon is is a amalgamation, it's a collection of different canons put into one, which is unique, and it needs a little bit of care in interpretation, obviously. So Canon 95, which is oftentimes referred to by people who want to talk about the boundaries of the church, the sacraments of the church, uh, is an amalgamation of previous canons, almost verbatim, one inserted into the other, and then new clauses are added to the end. The core of the canon is Canon 7 of the Second Ecumenical Council of Constantinople. Within this is inserted the first sentence of Canon 19 of the First Ecumenical Council. After this, there is added another section in addition to what had been decided in earlier canons. It is this addition that seems to cause problems for interpreting the canon. It is helpful, though, to remember that the canon is an amalgamation of canons with an addition to the end to expand the canon. Very important. I appreciate it, and I'm indebted to Father John Patrick Ramsey, who's, who's uh, you have the quote there, uh, the uh, link there, if you want to uh, look at it on academia. He's, he's done the work to examine the proper understanding of this canon. And I've, I'm going to give you the, the result, but if you want to see the whole process, you can go to that academia link. You can see how he worked through the different versions and he gives us the proper understanding of the canon, which unfortunately is very much misunderstood today. Very important canon, very much understood. So we're going to quickly read through it, and I'll point out where uh, people get it wrong, so you understand as well. <clears throat> we accept... One second. We accept those from heresies being added to orthodoxy and to the portion of those being saved. Now... That phrase, added orthodoxy, you remember that? That's from Acts of the Apostles. We talked about that earlier. Added to the church. And that's what happens. When people come, be they, they're added to the, the, that's how you become an orthodox Christian. You become uh, added to the church through the mysteries. Uh, and to the portion of those being saved, who, who are those being saved? Those who've been added to the church. Salvation, church, inseparable. According to both the service and custom submitted below. We accept Arians, indeed, Macedonians, and Novatians. We see that St. Basil, however, said they should be baptized. Here it says they can be chrismated. See the interpretive key here. What is it? Acrivia economia. Otherwise, you cannot make sense of these canons. Uh, we accept Arians, indeed, and Macedonians, and Novatians, those calling themselves clean, Cathari, in other words, uh, and Aristeri, and Fortinists, considered tetradites, and Apollinarists, giving documents and anathematizing all heresies, not thinking as, as the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church thinks, by sealing, that is, by anointing first, by holy myrrh, the forehead and the eyes and the nostrils and the mouth and the ears and the sealing, them saying, seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. You remember St. Basil said in his canon, make sure that everyone, if they're received by economia, nonetheless, they must be chrismated in the middle of the church in view of all. It's one of his one of his presuppositions here that needs to be kept. So in these particular heretics, the church at the time had decided they can be received by economia. We're going to, we talked about it before. We'll talk again. What's the criteria? What, what is the basis the church says that these particular heretics can be received by economia? In other words, the, the empty baptism, the form, the type is not going to be fulfilled uh, and in, in in by chrismation, what's the what's the what's the basis? Well, in a word, it's that they've maintained the form, the type, so that they can then be received. And the church deemed it 
on account of the many, economia enegas don polon, according to St. Basil. All right, so those, those are some of the criteria why the church does economia. Uh, and concerning the Paulinus, then taking refuge to the church, a rule has been set to rebaptize them in every case. All right, so that group, no way, no possibility of chrismation. Doesn't tell, doesn't tell us why. Just says that's what we're going to do. We can glean a little bit from other reason, other things like Saint Basil's canons mainly, for why that might be the case. But the canons don't have any; they don't feel the need to explain themselves. The fathers say this is what we do. See how. It's not, they're not trying to do ecclesiology here. We don't need to, we're not trying to figure out what the church is from these canons. That's a very mistaken way to look at the canons. However, eunomians, those baptizing into one immersion. All right, so here we have a reference to the form, the type. And they say, no way, cannot be chrismated because they're giving you the reason. They were baptized into one immersion. Well, that's not the baptism of the church. We have three immersions, three names of the Holy Trinity. And they are three persons of the one name of the Holy Trinity. Uh, and Montanus, those hereabouts called Phrygians and Sabellians, those glorifying, teaching, son, father, and doing other embarrassing things, and all the other heresies, pay attention, all the other heresies, no more distinctions necessary, any other heresies that exist, what do we do with them? For there are many there about, here about, especially those coming from the Galatian region, all those from them willing to be added to Orthodoxy, we receive as Greeks. What does that mean? Heathens. What do we do with them? We baptize them. That's what we do with heathens. And the first day we make them Christians, and the second, catechizing them. Then the third, we exercise them with the act of breathing thrice on their faces, and then we baptize them. All right? So that's all the other ones we baptize. And also, and here's the key word people get confused because of the different versions and translations that exist. He goes on now. This is the addition. This, this latter part is the addition that it's only in this can Canon 95. doesn't exist in the Second Ecumenical Council. The, going on further down. Also the Manichaeans and the Val Val Valentinians and the Marcionists and those out of similar heresies. What? What do we do with them? We baptize them. That's what that means. It is necessary to make documents and to anathemize their heresy. The Nestorians and Nestorius, and Nephticius, and Dioscoros, and Severius, and the remaining exarchs of these heresies, and those thinking their things, and all the aforementioned heresies. What did we do with them? Well, it's obvious here, we baptize them. That's what it is. People have been interpreting this because of a poor version translation, I don't know why, that they just received communion, period. And then it goes on, and thus lead to partake of Holy Communion. For all of the pre-mentioned heretics, after they're baptized, after they're chrismated, then they commune. That's all that's saying there. But it's been interpreted by many that this canon is saying that these other ones, these other heretics, uh, are going to be just received by communion. But that's unprecedented. There's nowhere in any of the canons that we talk about receiving people just by communion. So there's no basis to interpret this canon in that way, when we have all the previous tradition doesn't talk about that at all. At the very least, it's chrismation. All right, so that is Canon 95. Very important. We'll come back to that in the future. All right, last thing. We're going to cover St. Tarasio's Patriarch of Constantinople. And what did he do? <clears throat> what did he do at the Seventh Ecumenical Council? Now, it's a little hard to read here, but when you get the PDF, <clears throat> you'll be able to read it. Or if you want to go online <clears throat> and download on the Unity of the Church by St. Hilarion, Trotsky. It's a PDF, easily to find. Just put St. Hilarion on the Unity of the Church. You can find the text. Go to page 51. You can read it yourself. Um, but forgive me, so it's a little bit small here. But this is very important. I'm going to read to you, first of all, what St. Hilarion has to say here. And then I'm going to read to you uh, what St. Tarasios did. All right. Very, very important uh, for our understanding of economy and heresy. And this is an interpretive key, very important interpretive key. How do we deal with heresy? How do we, what's the church, the boundaries of the church? All right, so let's begin here. If you can read it with me. I wish I could make it bigger. I don't think I can. Um, let me see if I can. Hang on. Maybe I can. Yeah, but then can I, can I bring it so that you can see it? Or is that it? 
Not really. All right, so that's not going to work. All right, so let's let's. I'll read it to you. If the thought that heretics already have grace-filled baptism lay at the foundation of their being received without baptism, all right, by economy, then one would have to determine for each separate church exactly and without fail which of the heretics have baptism and which do not, and no such thing occurred. I'm at the top of 51 here on the right side of the page. The church permitted diversity of practice according to the conditions of place and time without differentiating very rigorously between dogmatic teaching of the heretics, all right? So the church didn't go, as we saw, they don't, they don't go into detail about the dogmatic differences between the heretics. They say, these are going to be received this way, these are going to be received this way. Now, here's the key, and one of the interpretive keys here. We go back to the Seventh Ecumenical Council. What did St. Tarasius do? And remember now, this is the return of, of hundreds of bishops, 20, 30 years earlier in Kyria, they had a massive council, iconoclast council, 368 bishops. They all were, they all agreed to the iconoclast theology. And now they have the Seventh Ecumenical Council. St. Tarasius is charged with bringing all these bishops. What are you going to do with them? You're going you're gonna to say they all they all need to go, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're pseudo bishops, they're nothing. What do we do with them? How do we receive them? And there were, there were monks and others who said, this is the worst heresy ever. We cannot in the, receive them by economy. They must all be re returned to the church by baptism or, or they need to be, uh, you know, not allowed to be bishops or whatever. Now, that's the crivia. But what about economia? What can we do in this case? Uh, and here's, here's what's very interesting. They argued at length about how to receive the bishops of the iconoclasts. Now, some of the some of the hardcore iconoclasts they, they they did not receive at all. Only those who repented, obviously, were going to be brought back in this way. Uh, so, one deacon and other monks, if you read the actual, unfortunately, uh, I couldn't get the English version. I didn't find the English version of this, but in the Greek, you can see that there are actually a, a, quite a number of monks at the council. Yes, monks went to councils, not just bishops, and they were arguing. Look, we've got to do a krivia. We've got to be exact. And it was one deacon. He says here wanted to transfer the question to the dogmatic soil and pose the question, is the heresy which has now appeared anew less grievous than those that preceded, or is it more grievous? So that was one of the questions they posed. In other words, from that, we'll figure out what we're going to do, right? Now, listen to what St. Tarasius says. Evil is evil, especially in matters of the church. As far as dogmas are concerned, it is all the same to err to a small degree or to a great degree, because in one case or the other, the law of God is broken. He's quoting St. James, the apostle. So again, I'm going to repeat that. It's very important because people today, Orthodox people are arguing, well, some heretics are closer. Therefore, we receive them by this way. Others are far away. No, that's not how the church thinks about this. Listen to what St. Tarasio says again. Evil is evil, especially in matters of the church. As far as dogmas are concerned, it is all the same to err to a small degree or to a great degree because in one case or the other, the law of God is broken. And we might add, and communion is lost. You, 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 the, the point here is that you've walked away from communion out of the church. You no longer have communion. That's what's been lost. Whether you, were, you lost it through Arianism, Monophysitism, Iconoclasm, Papalism, Protestantism, it doesn't matter. Now, what, what matters there is that it might be harder for you if you become an occult Satan worshiper. Obviously, it's going to be harder for you to become, come back. That's what's different. If you become a, a Jehovah's Witness, if you become a Mormon, you're going to be, have a harder time coming back to the church. Obviously, you've adopted even stranger ideas. And now you have more obstacles. In that sense, there is a distance. But in a sense of whether you lost communion with the church, there's no difference. And therefore, this idea that we have a worse or greater heresy does not impinge or does not uh, inform our decision in terms of economy. Economy is going to be on the basis of what's in the best interest of the salvation of the people and of the church. That's the way the church looks at it. Now, very important last little section here. I hope that you got that. Go back, download on the Unity of the Church, read it and reread it. 
If you want to become well-versed in the boundaries and the nature of the church.